In this video, I'm going to tell you about Newton's three laws, and this first slide is the shorthand summary of the laws. So why are we talking about these laws? Well, when you learn about linear and nonlinear motion, you're basically engaged in describing and predicting motion. This group of activities is referred to as kinematics. Once you have the tools to talk about things like acceleration, you might be interested in understanding why things accelerate, and dynamics is the part of physics that explores the relationship between forces, mass, and acceleration. Kinematics and dynamics together fall under the umbrella of mechanics. Way back in 1687, Isaac Newton published three laws in the Principia that form the basis of classical mechanics. They're kind of like Euclid's postulates that you learn in a basic geometry course in the sense that everything you learn in a mechanics course in physics can be traced back to these three laws, so they're important. Since the laws involve forces, we should make a quick pit stop to define the term force. A force is any kind of a push or a pull. In this picture, each of the stick figures is exerting a force on the box. The figure on the right is pretty clearly pushing on the box. The one on the left may be either pulling or pushing. It's kind of hard to tell from the picture. Notice that I'm using arrows to show the forces, and that's because force is a vector with both magnitude and direction. So now that force is defined, let's talk about Newton's laws. The first law states that an object at rest stays at rest unless acted on by an unbalanced force, and an object in motion stays in motion unless acted on by an unbalanced force. This is known as the law of inertia, and inertia is that tendency of objects to maintain their current state of motion. The best way to understand the law of inertia is to look at some examples. Here are two cute little stuffed animals sitting on a table, and the law of inertia says that in the absence of an unbalanced force, the animals will stay just where they are. But it gets even better than that. Let's say the owner of these animals comes along and pulls hard on the cloth. It turns out that she can pull it right out from under them and hardly disturb the animals. That's because they have inertia, and actually the more massive an object is, the more inertia it will have, so the more massive animals are more likely to stay on the table when the sheet gets pulled out from under them. The other part of this law says that objects in motion tend to stay in motion unless acted on by an unbalanced force. This part of the law is perhaps more difficult to accept because just about everything that slides comes to rest pretty quickly. But that's just because sliding things tend to experience friction, a force that acts in the direction opposite the motion, causing them to slow down. In other words, this book is subject to an unbalanced force. If I could take friction away somehow, the book would slide along without speeding up or slowing down. This air hockey table does a great job of getting rid of friction. The air hockey table has tiny holes all over its surface, and air is blown through each of these holes, setting up an air cushion between the puck and the table. This greatly reduces the friction so that the puck slides along without changing velocity, except, of course, when it hits a wall. When the puck comes into contact with the wall, it experiences an unbalanced force that causes it to change directions. Newton's second law states that the net force acting on an object is equal to its mass times its acceleration. The idea here is that if a bunch of forces act on an object, you can add them together or sum them, and this is the net force acting on the object. By rearranging F net equals MA, you can see that it's possible to find that acceleration by dividing the net force by the mass of the object. Because mass is a scalar, the acceleration vector of the object will be in the same direction as the net force, and if two objects with different masses are subject to the same net force, the one with the smaller mass will have the greater acceleration. Of course, if the forces add to zero, the object will not accelerate, and here's an example with three forces that add to zero. Notice how the tip of the third vector ends up back at the tail of the first. In this case, F net equals zero, so the acceleration is also equal to zero. The second law is at the foundation of many things in physics, so we'll keep coming back to this law. Finally, Newton's third law states that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. In some contexts, this is a really obvious law. Here's a picture of some shoes and feet that are connected to a body that's not shown, and obviously those shoes are pushing down on the floor. But the floor also pushes back up on the shoes, and that's why the person doesn't fall through the floor. So the action forces are the forces of the shoes on the floor, and the reaction forces are the forces that the floor exerts back up on the shoes. Each pair of forces is what we refer to as an action-reaction pair. Similarly, here's a shot of a hand pushing on a closed door. The action force in this case is the hand pushing on the door, and the reaction force is the door pushing back on the hand. It turns out that these action and reaction forces are always equal. 
But the amazing thing about the third law is that it applies even if the door is moving as you push on it. If your hand is pushing on the door, then the door is pushing back on your hand. The forces may be changing. The hand may be exerting more force at one moment and less force the next. And the door may be accelerating or it may not be. It doesn't matter. No matter what, if the hand is pushing on the door, the door will be pushing back on the hand, matching that force with an equal and opposite one of its own. In any situation where a force acts, there's always a reaction force lurking around. For example, if I drop this basketball, the earth exerts a force on the basketball. And what's the reaction to that force? Well, if the action is the force of the earth on the basketball, then the reaction has to be the force of the basketball on the earth. So this is the action-reaction pair. The third law is the weirdest of the three, but it's also the key to understanding many concepts, so it's important. So these are the three laws, and I'll leave you with the summary. They come up over and over again in physics, and if you pay attention, you'll notice that each new topic in mechanics, like momentum, for example, is derived from these three basic laws.